So, Varys, there's a debate when it comes to carbohydrate sources. On the one hand, you've got fruits, which are pretty easily digested, but you've got fructose, so it's a little bit stressful on the liver. On the other hand, you've got the cooked starch, which just contains glucose, yet it has AGEs and acrylamide, and it's harder to digest. Where do you land, you know, between these two? What would you recommend that people eat? So, if it's a healthy person which is very rare today, they can tolerate all real and whole foods. They can tolerate cooked rice and cooked starches. They can tolerate fruit. They can tolerate almost anything, vegetables, meat, and they have the gut flora to digest all this. Uh, but today we live in a different environment and the bodies are different. And so each individual has to see how they react to these foods. Um, in general, what I would advise is that if you are going to have fruit, you want to have it first thing in the morning and on an empty stomach. And the reason for that is, is because it's the fastest digesting food. And if you have that on top of cooked food, so especially starches, um, which digest a lot slower, it's going to sit on top of them and start to ferment. And that will cause reactions such as dandruff and various autoimmune issues because it's fermenting inside of the gut and it'll uh, lead to feeding candida. Um, but if you're healthy and you have a normal functioning pancreas, uh, a little bit of fruit first thing in the morning is great to hydrate yourself. It's also fairly detoxing. Um, and the raw water, the raw water that's in the fruit will hydrate your cells to an extent. If you're juicing the fruit, though, um, that's too much sugar. and You're just going to damage your pancreas because the fiber is not slowing down the absorption of that fructose. Uh, fructose in and of itself, though. It can't fuel the body the way that glucose does from starches. Um, the liver utilizes it. The brain can utilize a little bit, but it doesn't fuel muscle glycogen. The muscles can't use it for fuel the way that they can use glucose for fuel. Um, a lot of people today, though, they have damaged pancreases, whether they know it or not. And the reason for that is, is because um, since childhood, all of our commercial processed food has been fortified with high fructose corn syrup. And so everyone is suffering to an extent from some form of fatty liver disease. And it's fairly easy to reverse that. You just need to minimize the fructose for a time. Um, it focuses more so on protein and fat, and eventually you can tolerate a decent amount of fructose into the diet. Um, glucose, from, you can't obtain glucose from plants typically unless you cook the starches. In short, there's the uh, AGEs and acrylamides. But if you're a healthy person, you can tolerate a little bit. And if you have a, a majority of raw food in your diet, um, you should be removing those acrylamides every morning through your urine when you uh, drain your lymphatic system or when you sweat or when you exercise. Um, Further, you know, we find in a lot of cultures and civilizations, when they weren't fat-based, they were carbohydrate-based, and it wasn't based off of fructose and fruits, it was based off of starches, forms of beans and squash and potatoes, and they're completely fine, they live to 100 plus as well, like the Okinawans in Japan, whose staple was um, uh, sweet potato, and various forms of other starches and white rice, and there's a lot of cultures like that. So it really, again, depends on your body. However, if you have a compromised uh, digestive tract, um, you may not be able to tolerate starches too well. It may give you reactions. So that's an issue there. Uh, further, if you have a weak digestive system in general, if you don't produce enough hydrochloric stomach acid, mixing the starches and the protein may fatigue and exhaust you. And so you may need to do mono meals. You may need to have the meat by itself up until the time where your stomach acid is uh, replenished and your pancreas is functioning properly. Yeah. I know you said that with fruit, you should eat it by itself. You shouldn't combine anything with it. Always, always. Uh, you can have it with, uh, with butter. It'll digest fine with butter. And if you are um, dealing with blood sugar fluctuations, high and low blood sugar, the fat from the butter will slow down the absorption of the sugar. I was and it will... ask, Yeah, I was going to ask about that because obviously Ogenis von der Planet says that you should always eat fruit with fat to avoid a high blood sugar spike. 
but yeah. I guess that, according to you, might compromise digestion. Uh, butter with fruit, or cream, or um, not avocado because it's also a fruit, but animal fat in general. Butter is the best. Uh, cream can help a little bit, uh, but cream is a lot more difficult to digest than butter is, and so you have to see how you would react. All right. Combining the two. One of the more controversial things that Ogenes has said, or less controversial, I'd say, is that salt is a toxic rock. What mm. do you think about salt? Should we consume it? Should we not consume it? Because he said that even the natural salts aren't healthy. Yeah, so, you know, to him, all cooked food was toxic, even the cooked starches. But he recommended people to have them once or twice a week. And this is true. I mean, in nature, you know, everything is eating 100% raw food diet. But we, but we have adapted to consuming a certain amount of cooked food. Uh, if you're very ill, it's probably wise to really limit cooked food entirely. Um, salt, he, he, he advises against it, and I understand his reasoning. But it seems that uh, generally across the board, we all have an adaptation to salt. Um, it doesn't matter what culture you look at, whether it's a civilized culture or a primitive culture, they are all seeking salt. And you'll oftentimes find herbivorous animals, such as goats, they'll go to great lengths and climb on top of a steep cliff on the face of a mountain just to obtain a, um, a lick of salt from a salt mine. So even the animals instinctually know to go uh, and gravitate towards that concentrated source of minerals. The Nenet, who are a northern tribe <clears throat> in what is today Russia, they live in a very um, snowy, Arctic-like environment. They live around the Arctic Circle. And they're mainly uh, um, <clears throat> nomadic herdsmen of reindeers. And when they um, eat their reindeer, they, they have a lot of it raw because they're in the snow. There's no fire and they'll drink the blood. But when they open up the, the innards of the animal, they'll even uh, sprinkle pounds of salt on the blood and then drink the blood. Even though the blood is full of salt and electrolytes, they add more to it. Yeah, I've um, seen that exact and, video. And you've seen what I'm talking about. So, and then you have you always have to trust your own sensation and intuition when you're trying things. If you feel better, more energized after consuming salt, real salt, um, then you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't not include it in the diet just because someone said it's bad for you. You know our. Talk about fruit has got me thinking. When it comes to food combinations, I've noticed that many people are confused. You know, this this information about oh, you shouldn't eat fruit with anything, that's not common knowledge. So when it comes to food combinations in general, what are your guidelines? Okay. In general, you want to consume what digests the fastest first and what digests the slowest last. What's the most difficult to digest you wanna consume last. If you consume what's the most difficult to digest first, then all the other foods that you eat on top of that, which are supposed to digest faster, will simply sit on top of them and ferment. So again, fruit is one of the more most easiest foods to digest, uh, excluding melons. Melons should always be consumed uh, individually as mono meals. For some reason, everyone has issues with melons, but whether that's papaya, watermelon, especially uh, cantaloupe, banana. Uh, vegetables take a long time to digest because they have to travel through the digestive tract and and uh, rely on the uh, fermentation of uh, bacteria. However, they do act as a good fiber to push the cooked meat down if you're eating uh, cooked meat. Uh, Normally, the food that digests the best is going to be meat. Um, starches don't digest as well as meat. However, if you're going to have the starches such as rice with meat, you want to have the meat first because that triggers and initiates the production of hydrochloric stomach acid in the stomach. Whereas if you have the starch alone, it doesn't trigger as much uh, production of stomach acid and bile. So if you consume the meat first and then create that acidic environment and then have the rice on top of that, it'll digest better. 
Um, some people have very weak digestive systems and they can't produce enough acid. So when they have too many starches, those starches soak up the acid in the stomach and they end up getting fatigued and tired and lethargic because now the meat is just sitting in their gut, not being digested. So in general, my advice again is the foods that digest the fastest, eat those first and the ones that digest the slowest, eat those um, later, stack them on top of the faster digesting foods. Speaking of meat and animal foods, there mm -hmm. are people on the internet who are now saying that vitamin A is a pandemic, so to speak, that the population has very high concentrations of vitamin A in their livers, and they're getting problems because of that. What do you think about this? Do you think we have a vitamin A problem? Do you think some people should stay away from the vitamin A? Or do you think that, uh, no, people are actually deficient in vitamin A? Yeah, so it's both. <clears throat> um, we are all uh, burdened with toxic vitamin A, synthetic vitamin A, the kind of vitamin A you find in um, prescription drugs such as Accutane, which, are, which is extremely harmful, has so many side effects, it really ruins a lot of lives. And that is essentially a hyperdosed vitamin A. That's what Accutane is. Um, and a lot of the foods we consumed, which didn't have natural organic vitamin A in there, were fortified with synthetic vitamin A. And so that stuff does store in the liver, <clears throat> and it's very toxic. Uh, natural vitamin A, fat-soluble vitamin A, you only get it from pastured animal products. The fact of the matter is most people did not consume liver and organs and pastured butter, uh, pastured organic eggs with the very orange yolk. I don't know many people who consume that kind of food growing up. That's where you get real vitamin A from. So it'd be a very far-fetched to say that we've been um, inundated with real organic vitamin A. It's not. It's a synthetic vitamin A. But... Vitamin A, like iron, are very potent um, developmental nutrients. The vitamin A acts uh, more so like a like a, a pro hormone in the body. It develops tissue, as does iron. They're growth the growth promoting vitamins. And so, at a certain point in life, though, your body may tell you that it doesn't want any more vitamin A from even the organic products, because you don't want to be growing your entire life. At a, at a certain point in life, if you keep consuming growth nutrients, such as vitamin A and iron, um, it may just lead to the, the development and growth of cancers. You can't grow your bone, your skeletal structure, your brain, organs, and, and muscles uh, after a certain age when you're 40, 50, 60 years old. So at that point, it does uh, pile up in the body. It does store up in the liver, even when it is organic. And uh, it can lead to uh, the development and growth of uh, of um, of tumors. Yeah, that's so, interesting. I'd yeah. say that another problem with vitamin A is that vitamin A and vitamin D are antagonists. And something I've encountered with many people that talk to me is that they don't get a lot of sun. I, as an example, live in Sweden, so I only get three months of sun every year. So I barely get natural vitamin D. So my question is, what do you think about vitamin D supplementation? I know Ogenis says that all supplements are very toxic, but in this case, should one supplement or is the only solution to move to another country? In an emergency situation, supplements are crucial and necessary, whether they're B vitamins or vitamin D, B12, minerals, but they're not uh, ideal long-term. They're just crutches, temporary crutches. Um, eventually, the vitamin D supplements that you do take will cause toxic side effects. When you're in an emergency situation and you need to really increase your vitamin D levels, the supplement can help, but it's not a long-term solution at all. The long-term solution is to get as much sun as possible. Uh, in the northern climates, what uh, the Scandinavians and those in the British Isles did to consume uh, or to obtain vitamin D in the diet was they consumed uh, uh, seafood that was very high in these nutrients, namely fish oil, fish eggs or cod liver. And you have both, though vitamin A and D are antagonistic in those uh, 
animal foods, you find high concentrations of both vitamin A and D. And I don't recommend the consumption of fish oil. Uh, it, that's very rancid, and it is my belief that it will cause heart disease uh, over time and uh, all kinds of uh, damage to the body. You want to try to obtain natural cod and fish liver and consume that, or actual real um, fish eggs, fish roe. Yeah, I mean, that that is helpful, but still, I just want to tell the viewer that when you compare the amount of you know, um, IUs you get from the sun, I mean, if you tan in the sun, you might get 20,000 IUs, while even if you eat the most vitamin D dense food, which is, I believe it's called livers, you, mm -hmm. you barely get a thousand IUs. So it's a great supplement if you're eating it often during the winter um, in colder climates. And you know, you have an adaptation for uh, dealing with lower vitamin D levels. But still, yeah. I mean, sun, uh, to get enough vitamin D, you need the sun. So I guess, you know, moving to another country is, is the only option. Now, it's especially, you know, for someone like you, um, you don't have the genetic adaptation to a northern climate. Just the same way a northerner, if they went to Egypt or the Middle East, they would suffer really bad. They would burn. They wouldn't be able to tolerate it too well. So a lot of this has um, genetics and ancestry involved. You know, someone like you is going to uh, not fare, you're not going to fare too well uh, in the north as much as a native Swede would. Yeah. Now off topic, but speaking of vitamin D levels, what do you think about blood tests? What do you think, if, if you now have, you know, researched that topic, what markers do you think are important? What markers do you think are not so important? Because as an example, the West really likes to target LDL. Well, you know, fasting insulin is a little bit more important. And then you've also got the camp of Agenis van der Planitz, And he says that when you're on, you know, a raw diet, uh, you shouldn't care about blood tests because what you're going to see there is going to go, you know, up and down because of the nature of the diet, because of the de detoxification, because of the cholesterol dumping and this and that. Yeah. And Agenis said that on a raw diet, you wouldn't need to do blood tests. He's right. He is right. Um, and when you're initially, when you're unhealthy and doing, um, you're not doing too well, you may be inclined to go do blood tests. But from my own experience and from uh, my experience now with about 100 people, helping about uh, consulting over 100 people and reading their blood tests, it's never helped with anything. It's never helped with anything. <laughs> wow. You know, it, it can be a gauge, maybe show you low vitamin B12, your nutrient status, it can, uh, and then you and you can read, you know, you can read the LDL and HDL cholesterol levels. But according to the medical perspective, um, they understand it totally different than how much a naturalist like you and I or Agenis would understand it. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I think far better than a blood test, hundreds of times better than a blood test, is gauging yourself. How do you feel? Your own energy levels. How are you reacting to a certain diet? How are you reacting to food? You know, and then having your hand held and coached by someone who understands what they're talking about. Like, um, there's a guy, uh, he may not want me to mention his name, but uh, he was sent my way by you. Uh, do you know who I'm talking about? I know exactly uh, who you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, I've been con working with him for maybe about the past uh, four months now. And, you know, he kept doing blood work, um, many different tests, and he would show those to me. And I'd look at it and I kept uh, trying to encourage him and remind him that as long as he sticks to what I was telling him to do, he would be OK and not to freak out and worry. But he was he was always very nervous because he was in a very bad state. And so um I made a sincere intention to kind of hold his hand and walk him through this because I really did not like seeing him in that state. It was, it was a saddening for myself as well to see that. And uh, he kept with the protocol and he's had an almost uh, miraculous regeneration of his body. He still has a way to go, but simply using the, the raw food, he's really come a long way. And looking at his, his, uh, his blood work and the markers really didn't help us with anything. So, Varys, I think that 
he, from my understanding, had very bad leaky gut. And I think it would benefit the person watching immensely if you could tell us what he, what he did, what you told him to do. Because I think that would help many people that might be in his situation or might have the symptoms that he has, but, you know, they manifest differently. They manifest as acne and, you know, maybe not as strong as what he had. Uh, or any of the hundreds of other autoimmune disorders, because it, it, the doctors would diagnose him with basically an autoimmune disease, several autoimmune diseases. And the answer to healing and reversing that would be there is no solution. Nature is uh, retarded. Your body's retarded and it broke apart and there's nothing you can do. Take these drugs, right? That's what's, <laughs> that's the solution. Um, and your body's attacking itself. Your body's retarded. That's the medical paradigm. Uh, this young man, what happened with him was he was a very potent athlete, a very strong athlete, uh, a rower. And he uh, played at a collegiate level. And he was uh, by far um, ahead and above of, of uh, all of his peers. And so years of exercising like that and then becoming very lean and strong um, eventually ended up catabolizing the fat and mucus inside of his body, which cushions the organs and the digestive tract, the bones, the ligaments, and the joints. Um, and eventually he broke down, his body broke down and he was reacting to all the foods that he was consuming. Um, now before the body broke down, he was consuming raw milk. So he even had some raw food in his diet, but I then asked him, you know, uh, how were you eating and how much were you eating? And he was just shoving food down because that's what an athlete needs to do, especially when you're competing at that level. So he's. It was all whole food, good, healthy food, but he's just shoving down 3,000 to 4,000 calories a day. And you can only do that for so long before your digestive system gives out. And then on top of that, you're exercising and rowing for hours a day and you're becoming very lean. Your body will give out at a certain point. And so he got leaky gut and uh, essentially almost all of the autoimmune disorders we have today do stem from leaky gut. Uh, the medical paradigm likes to deny it. They like to deny uh, leaky gut or any idea of the intestinal tract uh, coming apart and the gut, gut junctions come apart, coming apart. And uh, they instead resort to the body just being stupid and attacking itself. I mean, think about what, how insane that is, that your body is stupid and it's attacking itself and we have no solution for you, but by these drugs. And so I explained to him, how he, he needed to go. First, what we did was we put him on carnivore. And because naturally that would be, you know, the, the least inflammatory diet, but it completely crashed his energy. He didn't feel well at all. And so I, I came to the conclusion, okay, this guy's gut, and he looked really bad. He had issues all over his scalp and face, chest. He wasn't doing too well and he was very fatigued. And so I came to... A series of conclusions by working with them, um, I decided that he wasn't uh, producing enough protein and fat digesting enzymes or hydrochloric stomach acid to digest these dense animal foods, the meat specifically. And that's why he was becoming very uh, fatigued and lethargic. Uh, so I put him on a uh, predominantly raw egg, raw dairy, uh, like raw butter and raw kefir type of diet with a little bit of meat. He made very little progress, um, but his energy picked up a bit because of the bacteria and hormones and enzymes in these raw foods. So he would notice that he would say, my energy is much greater, but my symptoms aren't subsiding. Um, and he kept, you know, he, he, he wanted to find that he was so anxious about a situation. He wanted to um, find what the cause was. And I kept being insistent that it's the gut, it's the gut. You lost mucus and fat in the gut. We need to just focus on your gut and work with it. And so we, what we ended up doing was then we, I told him to remove the egg whites, the raw egg whites, even from the best eggs you can find, because these can be also very potent allergens for a lot of people. And in the raw primal community, they don't acknowledge that because Ajinus never talked about it. Ajinus said that this was something he was very wrong about. He said that 
if you do have leaky gut, you should consume the whites from the raw eggs to, to create mucus. And I don't think that's smart at all. When you have lost mucus in the gut and you consume the raw egg whites, um, they become an irritant. They become an irritant. Uh, one of the ways to think about raw eggs is that the egg itself is like a seed. And the shell, you won't eat the shell because it's hard, but the white around the yolk is also another protective layer. And the inner yolk, it acts almost as an anti-nutrient. It's much harder to digest than the yolk is. So I told him to remove the whites and just have the yolks. And the milk, I, I insisted that he have it only in the form of kefir because it's far more pre-digested and it can be absorbed and utilized a lot better. And for his fats, I told him to focus a lot more on, on uh, cold pressed plant oils, such as avocado and olive, which are more kind of like a fruit oil, uh, but this, but nonetheless, they're plant oils. And uh, I told him how these can, they can be absorbed rapidly as opposed to the way animal fats are absorbed and your body will still utilize them to recreate cellular membranes, especially in the gut, to bring the gut junctions back together. And then, of course, and then all the protein foods, the meat foods, I recommended him to remove the lean protein for a time and only consume the gelatinous broths, like the oxtail soup. Um, and over time, as he stuck to that over two months, he's probably had now about a 75, 80% recovery. And the, the before and after pictures are, are pretty drastic. So this is something for everybody in the raw primal community to, to note. If you're having allergenic symptoms to anything in the diet, you need to look at um, the, the raw dairy proteins, whether it's milk or whether it's raw egg white. And if you're feeling very lethargic and fatigued after consuming meat, you should probably have smaller animals such as chicken and shrimp for a bit rather than beef all the time. I mean, I, I uh, talked to our friend, of course, in the beginning for, for two hours and we sat there and we discussed all of this. And I'm just happy that, you know, he's made such a great recovery. I mean, that's amazing, amazing to hear. I should get back to him. Um, I was going to ask about another thing that I see with many people, many people that you probably talk to, histamine issues. I had one uh, client that mm -hmm. whenever he ate something, he got, uh, you know, itchy. He got rashes from mm -hmm. the, you know, histamine reaction. He could, he, he, whenever he eats, he gets histamine reactions. And whenever he eats butter, he, you know, he gets this allergic reaction and he, he gets diarrhea and yeah, he has a hard time handling anything. And he has all these, well, autoimmune issues. So what, what do you recommend for someone who has histamine issues and all of these allergies? In my opinion, it's the same issue that our friend was dealing with. It's a leaky gut. Yeah, They call it different things. They call it histamine. They call it uh, rheumatoid arthritis. They call it dandruff. They call it acne, rosacea. Um, they call it IBS. They call it colitis. But it all comes down to the gut. And the fact that we've been given dozens upon dozens of experimental medications since we were children. Every time we had a flu, we were given antibiotics, which killed off the gut flora. We've been given genetically modified high fructose, high fructose corn syrup, which has had pesticides sprayed on it since childhood. Everyone's gut is destroyed. Yeah, and this, uh, this uh, man that I was talking about, he had gotten mm -hmm. many, you know, super shots Several ones. To superhuman, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, that's when his st symptoms started to get worse. So over time, after getting those shots, he he started developing these symptoms. And, and the conclusion that I made was, you've got leaky gut, and mm. you've probably caused a bunch of intestinal damage to some degree because of this pollution, because it has circulated down there and destroyed everything. And uh, of course... Yeah. They kill yeah. off the gut floor of these things. Yeah, that's also an important thing. And, you know, he was he was starting to eat meat. And I looked at his diet and I said, well, you don't have any bacteria source. Exactly. You're, you, you're, when it comes to histamine issues, bacteria are at play. 
you know, if you don't have any bacteria, your your regulation of everything is is gone out the window. That's why you see that people who take probiotics, even though they're not a very good uh, probiotic source, because you know it's a capsule, they their autoimmune issues they get better because now they're getting some bacteria into them. So and that's why raw kefir, fermenting raw milk into kefir, is the most potent uh, bacterial inoculation you can get, beneficial bacteria. And people have to keep in mind that 99% of the body's biological functioning is carried out by bacteria. So where are you going to get that beneficial bacteria from? You know, you have to get it from somewhere in the environment. Even uh, cultures who weren't eating much raw food, they still had a bacterial source, a probiotic food source in the diet. And at the very least, they were touching farm animals. They had their bare feet on the ground. They're working in farms. They're inoculated with the bacteria, with the natural world. Today, we live in very sanitized environments, and um, there's, no, uh, there's no inoculation of healthy bacteria into the body that can help perform these functions. The digestion, absorption, and assimilation of food, the removal of toxicity through the body, the, 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 um, the recycling of weak and old cells and rebuilding new cells, this all relies on bacteria. Speaking yeah. of working mm. on a farm, what I mm -hmm. see with many people that I work with, especially this uh, this young man with the histamine issues, is a lack of food access, a huge lack of food access. I mean, mm -hmm. people watch me and you and they hear raw kefir, raw butter, and they, they think to themselves, oh, I should really start consuming that. But then when they try to look for it, they don't find it. They don't find, they don't find it. They don't find grass-fed meat. They don't find many things that they really need to heal. So what many people start thinking about is I should, you know, move to the countryside and start farming. And that is something that many health conscious people express a lot more than the rest of the population, of course, because they're aware of many of the environmental factors that are, you know, destroying people in modern society. And so because you work, you know, at designing regenerative farms and you're involved in that entire process, I'd like to ask, when it comes to the young men and women that want to move to the countryside and start farming, but of course they've lived in suburban areas for their entire life and they know nothing about the countryside and they know nothing about farming, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them to sort of start the process? Okay, so two things to say about this. One is that the lack of access to these foods is by design. It's not by accident. It took two world wars to remove access to these foods. And that was by design so that they could make a lot of money while they have these type of foods. If you go to the most expensive restaurants and you look at the menu, it's all grass-fed, pastured meats, filet mignon, fish roe, fish eggs, right? wild-caught salmon. <laughs> they have access to these foods. There's uh, the British family, the royal family. They have the, the what is it called? Windsor Farm. Very beautiful dairy farm in the English countryside. And the cows, they sit on water beds and they have these like water jets massage their, their bellies. And that's why they live to 100. The, the women, at least, you know, the men are kind of, men, boys are going to be boys. They're going to do drugs and fornicate. And that really shortens lifespan. But the queen, she lived to 100. Her mother lived to 100. They have access to these things. Um, now, take, now, for modern people to get access to these foods, there's some good news about this too. What I would recommend first is take a permaculture design course. They're all over Europe and North America. It's called perm permaculture design, and they'll teach you about the ideas and principles of regenerative agriculture. And if you can take the course in person somewhere, you'll meet a lot of like-minded individuals. And from there, you'll have uh, networks, you'll build networks and connections to regenerative farmers in the countryside. Further, there's a website called uh, WOOF, W-O-O-F. Uh, just search WOOF regenerative farms, and you will find a list of these farms all around the world who are looking for um, farm hands and they'll give you a small stipend. They'll give you a place to live on the farm and you'll learn 
with hands-on experience. Now, I will warn people, um, when you go on that site, the most beautiful farms, which are in places like Hawaii or Washington State in the Pacific Northwest, um, they typically only accept uh, young, attractive females. <laughs> you know, it's like a community of of uh, people living on the farm, young people, and they don't want any more guys on the farm. They only and uh, they only accept young, beautiful females. And the guys typically they get relegated to working in a very ugly environment where the farm is just starting up, and you're basically the workhorse on the farm, <laughs> helping to start it up. So that's one way. Of woof. Um, and wherever you are, if you travel the countryside, you will find regenerative farms. All you have to do is a, is a search and then call them yourself and you'll be surprised with how many of them are actually willing to take you on as a farmhand if you call them and you're sincere about it. Where I am in North America, uh, especially here in the western half of the United States, they're all over the place now. They're all over the place. And um it's been my experience that if I'm not working with my network to help design one, help design swales and um, uh, an orchard and grazing system on a farm, if I simply call them and talk to them, they're more than happy to allow me cut, to come on to the farm and work. You know, yeah. So... Especially if you're willing to work like a workhorse, uh, they'd be. But if it's a very beautiful farm, again, that's like in the middle of. Hawaii or something and on the beach no that's uh <laughs> you've got to be a young attractive female for that <laughs> <laughs> okay something so happened recently about two months ago um there was a meeting I think it's called COP meeting um and it has to do with climate change I forget what the acronym stands for but it's where many of the world leaders come together and uh they try to tackle climate change and uh from the west here in the United States the ambassador that we have there is a guy named a uh, politician named John Kerry. He's a very senior politician. In my, in my opinion, he's one of the more admirable and respectable politicians we have in the United States. One of the last ones. And at this most recent meeting, they all came to the collective conclusion that they are, and this, these are many of the world's countries, the Chinese, the Middle East, the Americans, and the European, European Union. And they came to the conclusion that they were going to transition the entire conventional agricultural sphere into regenerative agriculture. So there's going to be a boom in this. There's going to be these jobs available, these careers available where you'll be able, you'll be able to uh, sustain a family and there will be uh, money coming in from the private sector, from the corporate sector and from, from government as well. So, and I would, you know, I had been seeing this playing up in the years and it was just, <clears throat> it was nice to see it finally happen. And it goes to show that uh, the people who developed our conventional farming system based on petrochemical agriculture and then petrochemical medicine, uh, they died a long time ago. They died, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And their grandchildren today, because of the shift in consciousness in the world, they are changing. They want to change the system. So it's, yeah, it's interesting because I I never thought the WEF would allow such a thing. That's that's very confusing to me that they'd allow conventional farms to you know a push for regenerative farming in general. I thought they wanted the world to burn. There's two ways that there's going to be two options for basically the coming humanity. <clears throat> By 2030, it's going to be very clear. Most people are going to be replaced with artificial intelligence and robots. There's no use for them to, for most of these jobs, there's no use. It can be done by a robot in artificial intelligence. Um, there was a survey I saw recently where hospital patients were dealing with an artificial intelligence program, and they said they preferred the artificial intelligence over the medical doctor. And most medical doctors today, even after a decade of schooling, when they're in the hospital setting, they have this app where they simply look at the symptoms, they plug the symptoms in the app, and the app tells them what to prescribe them. What the fuck kind of a doctor is that? <laughs> you know, nobody has any need for these people anymore. And so, um, and we're also going, so another decision they've made is that 
<clears throat> this capitalistic system, which has no regard for the natural world, um, in which growth and personal advancement is the only priority, that's going to come to an end as well. Um, and so a large amount of people are going to be utterly useless in this coming reality. And there's going to be, for the majority of people, two options. Either they will live in their home or their cubicle or their pod, and they will spend most of their time in virtual reality. They won't have a family or kids. Um, the family structure, the, the, the institution of marriage has been to a large extent already dissolved. I just don't think people realize it yet, but it's dissolving. Um, and they'll be given a, a stipend every month, 1,000 or 2,000 dollars or euros through universal basic income. And it will be um, adjustable money so they can change how much they give you depending on how you act and how you behave. Um, and the money that they can give you, for example, they'll give you 2,000 and they'll say, okay, here's 400 for your food. Here's 600 for your rent. And we can watch you spend that 600. So you can't spend that 600 on anything else but rent. Here's 400 for your, your porno subscriptions, your Netflix and your Taco Bell, your fast food. <laughs> and that's going to be the reality. And uh, from what I observe today, a lot of the young men my age, they already live in that kind of a reality. They're already in there. They're on TikTok and Snapcrack and Snapchat and Instagram. And they're just scrolling through their phones. Let, let us make it easier for them. They don't have to work anymore and, um, you know, burn emissions and pollute the planet and sit in traffic and cause this chaos. We'll just put them in a pod and put them in a virtual reality. And voila. Now, aside from that, there's going to be a second option. And it's going to be for those of us who actually want to renaturalize again, put our bare feet in the earth and pick up a shovel that option is going to be there. So it's, it's, everyone's going to be happy. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, boys will be boys that men mm -hmm. who fornicate a lot, they, they live less, they degenerate faster. And so of course, if you go to Reddit and on YouTube too, you'll find SR. So what do you think about SR, you know, not letting the life-giving substance out and keeping it in? Ultimately, it's what distinguishes a man from a boy. Ultimately. And the whole purpose of the religious traditions was to convince, or even if they had to uh, force people to be virtuous. So they could live pleasant lives on earth. And the thing is, the amalgamation of that substance in the body, it develops the human being. It develops the glands and organs and brains physically, but it also develops the soul or what the Chinese would call the pearl body, what the Christians would call the light body. It develops a consciousness that is able to separate from the body and not identify with the mortality, the mortal self. And that is extremely necessary if you want immortality beyond death. Because if you don't uh, attain separation from your mortal desires and aversions, uh, then upon death, you go the same way that a leaf goes when it falls from a tree and lands on the soil. It just turns into compost and disappears. It returns to the spirit that way. It doesn't retain its individual monadic consciousness. It's like a water drop that dissolves into an ocean. Um, today, and you know, you reminded me of a story of just how weak most men are today. And what's making them weak is a lot of the social media stuff. Um, the TikTok, Snapcrack, and all that. They're just watching women all day, young women dance and shake their asses. Um, I had gone to Afghanistan you know, uh, four or five, five, six months ago. And I had gone with uh, a distant friend of mine. And uh, when I was there, you know, I got to be around him for a few days and I couldn't believe how glued he was to his phone. Like, like an imbecile, like a child, just scrolling from one social media app to the next, liking pictures like a sim. And I saw the effect that had on him, not only 
was tearing him down physically and, and morally. Um, but being in that environment, being in Afghanistan, he panicked. He panicked and he, and he left like on day four, day five. And you're supposed to be there for a lot longer. And the reason why he fled was uh, or left, ended his trip sooner, was because he couldn't handle the raw reality of the environment. There was a form of cowardice there that modern men have. And it's entirely due to the simping. They don't have the virtuous element in them. When, I, when we first landed and we walked around for the first hour, I looked at him and I told him, my God, I thought I was some shit. I am like a low testosterone beta male compared to all these men here. It's like a country of, of, of lions. And th there's this quote Alexander the Great had when he went into Afghanistan. He wrote a letter to his mother and he said, um, in this world, you have birthed only one Alexander, but in this land, every man is an Alexander. Um, and it's not, you know, my friend was an ethnic Afghan as well. So it's not that it's a genetic thing or an ethnic thing. It's a virtuous thing. Virtuous creates this kind of masculinity. And in that uh, country, the reason why they've been so successful in defeating foreign empires is because they um, they shun unvirtuousness. They, sh they, they, they shun simping. They shun it completely. And so they've created a martial culture. And, and then I was reminded, you know, when this when this guy left because he couldn't handle the 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 raw ruralness and um the raw ruralness of the country when he left i was then reminded of how whether it doesn't matter what ethnicity they are most western men today are very weak and it's again the social media the food all this stuff but western man himself his ancestors four or five hundred years ago got on ships sailed across the atlantic ocean and through perilous nights with large waves and storms, landed on the coast of America on this new land, this new world, with these primitive, strong, um, brutal native Indians that they came face to face with, and then marched forward and conquered from sea to shining sea. Today's Western man is nothing like that. Not one one hundredth. And so... You know, nutrition is one thing, and I talk a lot about nutrition, but in a lot of my work, I, 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 I in a sense, point at the underlying truth that the nutrition is, it means nothing if you're not concentrating it. If you're not concentrating it and convert, converting it to virtue, you'll get nowhere. Wow. I mean, that's, that's uh, I feel like boxing right now, you know, hitting a bag. <laughs> that, well, that was inspiring to hear. And I mean, this was our, you see, this was all of our ancestry because the men back then weren't such simps. They would get a wife, you know, and they would reproduce with her and they would make love to her. But women were not the end all. Heroism was the end all. Affirmation of life, conquering reality, conquering nature. Today's men, all they're looking forward to is the, the next jack off. You get what I'm saying? There's no affirmation of life. So how does a man concentrate the nutrition into virtue? I'm guessing SR is one way of doing it. Are there any, any yeah, it, other it things? Happens that naturally. Might... It happens naturally if you have your mind straight. Okay. So there's nothing to do. Just there's it happens naturally. Yeah. Now, if you have psychological issues... At that point, you need to actively start doing yogas and various meditations because as the virtue and the nutrients concentrate, um, it needs to fill the ojas. Are you feeling familiar with that term? Or vriya, vriya and ojas. It needs yes. to fill up into the rest of the body. Um, and if you have severe psychological issues and emotional problems, it can't rise up into the rest of the body. It's it's like a dam that's clogged down there and the only way it can go is out it can't go into the kidneys the the intestines the liver the heart the eyes and brain it can't reach these areas um and that's what yogas and meditations are for they're to help and that's what alchemy essentially is just to help the mind the emotions and the body to sit together harmoniously so that everything can function naturally in the body the primitive people the pagan people of the world to them, they have really no need for meditation or yoga. They're sitting around 
the jungle laughing, smiling, dancing, happy. Everything is flowing naturally. Do you get what I'm saying? So um, concentrate it. If you're happy and healthy, spend time in nature. It will just fill up in itself. And you naturally will start getting inclinations for great work. If you find that you're too bothered when you're concentrating this stuff, um, you need to do yoga and meditation. You need to focus your mind on cultivating joy within yourself. Yes. And for if the viewer didn't know what Ojas or Virya is, it's basically the term for sexual energy, but in the Indian spiritual culture, so to speak, mainly in Hinduism and in Vedanta and you know the, the type of yogic traditions. Um, now we did d delve into you know soul and uh, what happens after death and uh, fairly religious things that you know are on the belief side of things. So I wanted to ask. I know you've said that you're a maybe you were a part or you're still part of Sufi orders, Muslim Sufi orders. But your view on religion is, um, it, it doesn't sound like it's a Muslim speaking, so to speak. It's very different. It's something yeah. else entirely. And so mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on religion? What are your thoughts on the Abrahamitic religions? What is true? What is not true? How should one approach this? So I was born into Islam. Um, I was unhappy with it and I wanted more and I kept searching in Islam. And then I found the Sufi orders which are the more initiatic, esoteric traditions of Islam. And that's great and all. And someone could just stay into their own religious tradition. And in Christianity, you have the same thing. You have these esoteric orders for those who seek more. So, um, but I personally went around studying and researching everything because I'm just a very, very curious person. And I would say that uh, the sphere of knowledge that I am most versed in is actually the Western occult tradition. It's the Western occult tradition. Um, Rosicrucianism, uh, free dawn, and even Freemasonry, although I'm not a Freemason. Um, now, the way that I see these religions, imagine that you are a, a, a wolf traveling through the mountains, okay? And you have a destination to get to. You know that you have a destination to get to. And you look at the left side of the valley, below and you see a billion two billion christians like sheep traveling to that same destination they are on the valley floor they don't see the higher picture but the religious confines herd them like sheep and they acknowledge themselves that they are the sheep of jesus christ on the right side of the valley you see muslims again another two billion sheep confined within the religious tradition they're not confined within the religious tradition. They, they wander off and they get lost. And then they don't know what gender they are. So, and they're, and they're all going somewhere. And this traveling of these 2 billion people, this religious tradition, it's trying to develop them not only in this life, but there's a, a as above, so below. Upon death, there's an ascension that they also all achieve and attain. They go to heaven along those confines, along those that mental, psychological framework. And you look on the other side, there's going to be Buddhists and Hindus. So all of these religions, they exist in their own ecological zones, ecological niches. And they, they are adapted and fit in a given area depending on a people's constitution and psyche. So for example, Buddhism, you'll find it more so in East Asia. The Tibetan Plateau, China, Vietnam, Korea, Japan. Islam is uh, covered. Islam covers more so the desert areas of the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. That is itself one ecological niche, and the, uh, and then Christendom you're going to find it in in Europe, in the West. The places where people live, their environment and climate, dictates how they're going to perceive objective reality. All of them are perceiving the same reality, but a bit different. Just the same way that all of them seek nutrition, but have slightly differing diets, religion is exactly the same. And so you can't tell, a, a Muslim from the Middle East and the desert can't go to Scandinavia and tell them this is the truth. 
How, how can that be possible? The Scandinavian has an entirely different genetic constitution. He has a totally different climate and environment. He's going to see it according to what suits him. Does that make sense? So there's no one true religion. They're all true religions. And they're all serving their role, which is to, again, to try and concentrate virtue and humanity, prevent them from being decadent, have them evolve and develop properly in this life, and then attain immortality in the next. So what I'm getting is that with religion, it's not so much about what is objectively true about the universe, but it's more so a system for a population to not stray away from the path, if, yeah. if you know what I mean. There, there's a sense of objective truthness in there in that uh, the most primitive purpose of the human being is to develop healthily and naturally, just as all the primitive people do, and then ascend into heaven. The problem is, is that when you bring people into a cosmopolitan state, into an empire, into a city, and they come from various different ethnicities and races and backgrounds, they very quickly fall into degeneracy. They'll start having sex with each other's wives, there's adultery, there's lying, there's stealing, there's illegal land acquisition. Do you get what I'm saying? Whereas if you remove all of those people back into their shire, you take them back into their own rural pagan roots, they naturally live normal lives again because they're living amongst their cousins and uncles. And if they step out of line, the elders beat the shit out of them. But when you bring them into a cosmopolitan state, um, that is, that's not the case. And, and the purpose of Christianity and Islam specifically uh, were to um, harmoniously develop civilizational states. You can't build a cosmopolitan civilization under Tengriism or Scandinavian paganism. It's not going to work. It's not a common morality that many different cultures and ethnicities will adhere to. But Christianity did serve that purpose, and Islam also served that function and purpose because they're cosmopolitan religions. Buddhism is not the same as that. Buddhism does not necessarily, it never developed a cosmopolitan civilization or culture. Not to say that it's wrong, but the, the, the focus of Buddhism is more so building a hermit kingdom. Is that not what it did in the Tibetan plateau and Zen Buddhism in, J in Japan and so on? It's about, it's about developing a hermit kingdom and in their perspective, in reality, life is suffering. Life is suffering, and the, the human condition is always one of uh, swinging between uh, aversion and desire. And because the human condition is always swinging between aversion and desire, it's always in suffering. And so the Buddha said, screw it all. It's all illusion. It's all samsara. Let's go into nirvana. But that kind of a mental framework, although it's accurate and, uh, and you know, they, it, it's all one consciousness, that kind of a mental framework does not work when you're bringing together many different cultures, ethnicities, and people into a, into a cosmopolitan state. It works well when you go to Japan, when, like when they have the samurai and the shogunate, and they're all living in rural valleys as gardeners and farmers and aristocratic warriors and priests, but it doesn't work in the city state. You see, what I've found, if I may share, is that mm -hmm. with Buddhism, you've sort of got, there's there's this monk who is now dead, who's called Thich Nhat Hanh, and... I know who you're talking about. Yes, yeah. and he wrote a book <clears throat> where he compared Jesus with Buddha, and mm -hmm. he, he looked at the similarities between their teachings. Mm -hmm. And from my own perspective, as someone who was a Muslim for a very long time and has researched religion quite a lot... What I see is that in, in the Quran and in, in Christianity, they speak in parables. And yeah. there's a lot of focus on virtue. It's yeah. not very technical, but, but there are many stories. And Allegories. Instructions yeah. about how a person should live. Yeah. And that is very suited toward, you know, letting, you know making it sure that the population, that the people within the population don't stray away from the path. While what I found with Buddhism is they basically remove everything that is not, okay, this is the way it is. They leave no riddles. In, no dogma. 
es- yeah, essentially what you find there is that, mm-hmm. yes, they have made a religion out of it, but originally it was just Siddhartha Gautama who eg- just relentlessly searched for what the human experience is and found it. And so he started teaching, and he did that until his death. And what he got, you've got many people, like nowadays, Shinzen Young, Peter Ralston, and so on and so forth, who have essentially achieved the same thing and explained the same thing as he has. So from my perspective, it's essentially not a religion. It's just, this is the way human experience is. Like, Mm. there is no self. That's what they, he found. That's what he tried to say, but then they made a religion out of it. So, I mean, are you familiar with these ideas? I am. I very much am. Um, So, I agree with everything you said here, but keep this in mind. And this is my own opinion, and you may agree with it or not, but the East Asian mind is far more refined and sophisticated than the Middle Eastern mind and even the European mind. Would you agree? Yeah, to some degree. I mean, look at what Japan produces. Exactly. And the Chinese in general. They're, they don't have any tolerance for allegory, parable, and dogma, and ritual, and bullshit. They don't have much tolerance for it. They're very refined... Um, race of people so they just want it straight and direct the thing is the western mind and even the middle eastern mind if you tell him there is no self he may want to cut your tongue out he's not ready for that kind of a reality he's not ready for that kind of a teaching do you get what i'm saying yeah i get what you're saying yeah nonetheless you know um uh the 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 buddhist tradition it cuts straight to the point it skips the degrees and takes you straight from one to the to the highest and just go just go straight up. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. There's nothing. Just shut up and go straight. <laughs> and this is a, again, um, it's a mirror. The fact that they all adopted this in East Asia, it's it's a reflection of their psyche and mind. And you being uh, young yourself, you're 21 years old, and you gravitating towards that, it just shows the nature of your own mind and your own development and maturity. Thank you. You don't need you don't need a sky daddy to constantly encourage you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Some people need a sky daddy. Let's get into <laughs> that, by the way, because because that's a big thing. I there are of course many of of those who who listen to us. They are religious, and the hmm. the basic thing that you find with with anyone in modern society who is a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew is they, as you say, using your own terminology, they have a sky daddy. They visualize God as an entity that specifically cares about everything that has to do with their self-survival. And that's mm-hmm. why they cling to their religion, because they feel like having the image of God or believing in God and being, you know, vir- not virtuous, but following in line with his instruction is going to aid in their self-survival. Now, now, for for the Muslims and Christians out there, what would you say about you know the sky daddy? So, two things: he doesn't care about you, but he also loves you. <laughs> Everything is going to be okay. <laughs> um, now, their perspective on things, though, is still valid. It is. To, according to their psyche and their mind and their type, it is still valid. Um, a volcano erupts and kills millions of people. Where was the sky daddy at that point? An earthquake happens and kills millions. A tsunami happens. Where's the sky daddy? To the sky daddy, uh, this mortal life is nothing. And especially if you have a grasp or concept of immortality, then even to the individual, this mortal life is nothing. It's just a physical realm you're incarnated in and you try to enjoy it or develop certain faculties. But uh, it's it's not it's not as serious as they make it out to be. Physical reality is not as serious as they make it out to be. Now, nonetheless, if the Buddhist tradition, they have that term bodhicitta right? The Buddha mind. And they had placed an emphasis on cultivating compassion and wisdom. 
they have those values and ideals because they also inherently understand that these qualities are necessary for the development of their own soul, for the development of their own consciousness. Um, in the West, in the European, in the Christian and Islamic tradition, they also have these, you know, this, these morals and dogma of God, the judge of having a judgmental God, having a merciful and compassionate God. And essentially, though, these are all qualities in the hierarchy of being. The universe is based on uh, these ideals and values in a transcendent manner. Whereas nature, nature itself, the physical world is, is based off of brute force. It's the lion which hunts the, the pregnant gazelle, tackles it down, rips open its stomach and eats the fetus. This is the world of nature. It's pure brutality. Um, but beyond that, there is the love and compassion of God. There is this, this ever-loving, sustaining Holy Spirit. That stuff is all valid. It's, it's there. Um, and an underlying theme in these Western traditions, especially in Christianity and Islam, is that upon death, there will be a judgment and a punishment or reward based on their intentions and actions. Right? Yes. Uh, and this, these ideas, they, they actually trace back to Egypt, but they expended in hieroglyphs. Uh, there's a hieroglyph in Egypt where they where they're explaining the afterlife. They show a heart on a scale, and it, and it's measured against the weight of a feather. It's a symbol, and so if the heart is heavier than the feather, then the soul ends up composting. It doesn't attain immortality. If the heart is lighter than the feather, meaning that it lived a pure life, it did cultivate uh, benevolence towards others, it is able to ascend and uh, into a higher octave. Um, the Buddhist tradition, how do I explain this? In, in the Islamic and Christian tradition, they have the idea of the seven heavens, the seven octaves. So there's, there's depending on the judgment and reward, there's certain octaves you can graduate to depending on how sincere you were in your actions and intentions. Whereas in the Buddhist tradition where they, where they focus on it being completely all consciousness, they kind of skip all those grades and octaves and they go directly to the supreme consciousness, if you want to call that, if you want to call it that. Again, it's the Asian mind not having any tolerance for the grades in between. It just wants to go all the way. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, well, it does. Now, with that said, I don't think I have any more questions. I think the person who has listened to this has had an absolute delight. Whereas you should know that out of all the people that um, you know, watch me, I think when they see your name in, in a video, they see that there's a interview that you've done, you know, they, they jump up and down with joy because it's such a delight to listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad now, to hear Thank you for, for, for this interview. If, if there's any words I can end with, um, I know a lot of people may be triggered by a lot of what we said, especially, you know, um, people who adhere to their religion as if it's a, a sports team, you know, or a yes. political team. Do not let any of what we discussed or say shake your faith. There is a supreme being there will be a judgment. There will be a punishment and reward. Uh, there is karmic balance in the universe. For every action and for every force, there's a force of equal or greater reaction. And it's all in the infinite intelligence and wisdom of consciousness, of God. Uh, they're synonymous to me. And if we can distill any wisdom from what we just spoke about here, it is that virtue is good. Virtue is very good for you. Delete your simp apps. Eat well. Be happy. Put your bare feet on the earth. Get in the sun. Life is beautiful. Thank you, guys. You're welcome.